Troisa, and welcome. In this video, we'll explore four Neolithic sites in North Pembrokeshire. Starting off at St Gwyndaf's Church, we'll walk to Garn Wunder, then the Cromlech at Fern Penru, and the trio at Garn Wen, before jumping back in the car to revisit a personal favourite, Fis Sampson. And if you want to skip ahead to a particular site, chapters are down below. Just a couple of miles from Abergwine or Fishguard, is the village of Clanunda in the community of Penkaya. Despite not being a peninsula, the area is often referred to as the Penkaya or Strumblehead Peninsula. Before we delve into the area's Neolithic past, let's take a quick look at a local story from the late 18th century involving Clanunda and its church. In 1797, some 1400 French troops landed at this rocky point, ready to invade. This event is known today as the Battle of Fishguard, the invasion was intended to divert British attention from a renewed attack upon Ireland, by which the French hoped to conquer the island kingdom on its own soil. Led by the Irish-American colonel William Tate, the force comprised supposedly a ragtag collection of soldiers, including many a newly released jailbird. On Wednesday, February 22nd, the French warships sailed into Fishguard Bay to be greeted by cannon fire from the local fort. Unbeknown to the French, the cannon was actually being fired as an alarm to the local townsfolk. But nervously, the ships withdrew and sailed on until they reached a small sandy beach near the village of Tlanunda. Upon landing, the French invasion force appear to have run out of enthusiasm. Perhaps as a result of years of prison rations, they seem to have been more interested in the rich food and wine that the locals had recently removed from a grounded Portuguese ship. After a looting spree, many of the invaders were too drunk to fight, and within two days the invasion had collapsed. Tate's force surrendered to a local militia, led by Lord Cowdor on February 25th, 1797. During the Battle of Fishguard, invading soldiers raided many homes, and some broke into the nearby church at St Gwyndaf, thought to be seeking shelter from the cold and wet. Damage was caused to the church, as well as a Welsh Bible from 1620 which after being restored, now sits in a glass case within the church. It is speculated that the soldiers tried using the Bible for kindling. The parish church of St Gwyndaf was founded over 1200 years ago and was used by pilgrims traveling between St David's and St Dogmails. The main structure that we see today dates from the 13th to 15th centuries, but refurbishments took place in the 19th century. The church also has several carved Celtic stones built into the walls. According to the National Churches Trust, these were picked up from the land and used in the Victorian refurbishment. One Celtic stone remains in situ in the graveyard. A common interpretation is that these indicate that the early Christian building was constructed on an even earlier pre-Christian sacred site. Nearby is a beautiful holy well where pilgrims were said to bathe their feet. These wells have been used and regarded as sacred for many ages, and this one has been particularly well kept even today. To the south of the village is the rocky outcrop, home to Garn Wunder. We made our way up from the church to the Neolithic monument. Apparently this rocky outcrop was also occupied by the French troops during the Battle of Fishguard. Similar to other sites dotted around this headland, Garn Wunder is classified as an earth-fast chambered monument, in that it is comprised of a large stone slab or capstone propped up by a single stone upright, with the southern end of the capstone resting on the earth, thus forming a chamber. The chamber encloses a deep rock-cut depression and is generally considered to have never been covered by a mound. Garnwunda was excavated by John Fenton in 1848, son of the famous Victorian antiquarian Richard Fenton. Ideas were very different at the time, and it was fashionable to call dolmens and other ancient structures druidical monuments and attribute them to so-called druidical ceremonies, with claims of some of them being used as altars for human sacrifice. 
Today, however, it is widely accepted that the Druids were not the original creators of these monuments. That isn't to say, however, that they were not used in their rituals and worship, whatever they may have been, and they are still regarded as sacred sites today by people of many differing beliefs. It's interesting to hear what these Victorian antiquarians thought about these ancient sites, so the following is a quote from his father's book, A Historical Tour Through Pembrokeshire, as well as John Fenton's publication in the Archaeologic and Brensis. Proceed to the village of Clanunda, in which the parish church is situated, where, on the verge of the rocky eminence just above, stands a cromlech, resting obliquely on one stone about five feet high from the ground whose dimensions are 15 feet by 9, nearly of an equal thickness of 2 feet, and uncommonly smooth for so large an unhewn slab of such coarse kind of stone. On a ledge of rock a little higher, behind it appears a detached mass of stone of a most grotesque appearance, as if art had been made use of to add to the wildness of nature, so that on approaching the cromlech it very forcibly arrests the attention and inclines one to suppose that it might have been, from its singular form and position, meant for an object of idolatry. It is generally observed that cromlechs and other relics of druidical worship are often found in the neighbourhood of Christian churches, which were purposely built there to purge the idolatry, or for the reason that influenced the first missionaries in Ireland, who, in order to prevail in greater points, were forced to comply with some of the druidical superstitions and instead of abolishing them entirely, thought it best to give them only a Christian term, for not being able to withdraw them from paying adoration to erected stones, they cut crosses on them and raised temples to the living God near the scene of their idolatrous worship. The following is a quote from Richard Fenton's son, John. The superincumbent stone has evidently been moved forward from its original position, and the principal supporting pillar to the north, and the only one upon which it now rests, in front is much further in than at first, while the end of the upper stone to the south has, in consequence, declined so as to touch the smaller stones which originally encircled the cistvane, and which probably were not the old supporters. I attribute this alteration to the cromlech having been, at some former period, dug into for the sake of exploring the recess underneath, which circumstances led me also to be cautious in making any deeper search. But for the quantity of red and black ashes, mixed with portions of what seemed to be decomposed burnt bones and small fragments of very rude pottery, which I found at the time in the hollow below, I felt no hesitation in forming a conclusion that it had been a place of internment. The upper side of the incumbent stone is free from all marks of fire, so as to render it doubtful whether it had ever subsequently been used for sacrificial purposes. There is a curious looking stone upon the summit of the ledge of rock to the southeast of the Cromlech and overlooking it, which with a little imagination might be converted into a rock idol and has every appearance of having been placed in its present singular position. It seems quite detached from the main rock and is seen in the accompanying sketch, which is a view of the Cromlech looking southeast. It may be observed that this transition from the use of places for sepulture to that for sacrificial purposes is to be accounted for inasmuch as it is a received opinion that the graves of heroes and chief priests of antiquity were ever held sacred and resorted to upon high occasions, whence also in process of time the subjects of such commemoration became, in the ages of superstition, deified and might have given rise among the druids to altar worship. The relic in question is rather interesting because it proves the fact that churches were frequently founded where such remains existed, probably with a view to do away with the old pagan rites by substituting upon the same spot a monument of Christian worship. By 1883, the finds by John Fenton were being described as an urn and bones, while the PAS records that a small urn containing calcined bones were discovered. It was of coarse manufacture and crumbled to pieces. A short walk, and characteristically muddy on a damp February afternoon, takes us to our next destination, another Neolithic cromlech, this one situated in a field next to Fern Penru. The farm is still active and also hosts a B&B. A report from 1925 says that on the field known as Parker Gromlech, Next to Penru Farmhouse stands a cromlech, 
the chamber of which is now filled with field-gathered stones. The capstone has been overthrown and lies at the feet of its quondam supporters. The capstone, which was still displaced when the chamber was reviewed by Grimes in 1936, has now been re-erected upon the three surviving supporters. The little that remains of an enclosing mound is being rapidly dispersed by careless ploughing. It's a fairly odd-looking monument compared to most that we've visited in Pembrokeshire. Very low, and the supporting stones almost forming a box, very much like a cyst grave to our eyes. But as it has been re-erected and the earthworks ploughed into obscurity, it's hard to say what it would have originally looked like. So after taking some time to imagine and daydream, we carried on to the next site. Up until around 2016, this site was inaccessible due to overgrowth and mostly forgotten. Accounts online say that the field was being used locally to dump rubbish and ride motorbikes, oblivious to the ancient monuments underneath. Today, the site is a bit clearer and accessed via a footpath next to a signed car park. Unfortunately, the path is covered in broken glass, so be really careful if you're bringing dogs with you. Often referred to as the Garnwen Cemetery, Construction is estimated to date back five or six thousand years. At the entrance to the site, there's a notice board showing one of the theories of how the capstone was placed. There are a lot of theories around the construction techniques of these sites, but this is one of the odder illustrations we've seen. Let us know what you think in the comments, and maybe we should make a video covering all of the theories. The sea view is obscured by a development of houses, and the three monuments are just over the fence from the back gardens, squeezed into a little strip of land. A 1997 report by Children and Nash say they were individually covered by round mounds. They also suggest the remains of a fourth cromlech lies to the north, in line with the other three. But a Pembrokeshire archaeological survey from 1897 to 1906 reported that there were nine. If you've been watching our channel or visit a lot of these sites yourself, you've probably noticed that a very wide variety of monuments fit into the category that we call dolmen, or more commonly here in Wales, a cromlech. Today, nobody knows for sure what the original purpose was, or how they were built, and we have no real idea of how they originally looked. The most common theory we are presented with is that they were places to bury the dead, or places for mortuary, ritual-type activity. We like to keep a very open mind and explore all of the different ideas, but language being a very interesting thing, the same words can mean very different things to different people. So we thought it would be worth including an excerpt from an article on archaeology.co.uk that discusses the use of the word dolmen. This view, that all dolmens are the relics of monuments designed for burial, has led archaeologists to invent a whole raft of new typological terms, including megalithic tomb, sub-megalithic tomb, demi-dolmen, chambered tomb, portal tomb, portal dolmen, type 1 and type 2 passage grave, and gallery grave. Some of these are further subdivided into simple, classic, and devolved forms, while some structures have defied categorization altogether. This shift in terminology has had the effect of turning attention away from the monument's form to consideration of its function, with the sole apparent purpose of the structure being to create a stone chamber to hold human remains. Barbara Bender in Stone Worlds 2007 objected to the dry typologies into which megalithic structures in all their infinite subtle variation have to be squeezed, while Tim Darvill and Jeff Wainwright, in their chapter on prehistory in the Pembrokeshire County History 2016, came close to rejecting all these subcategories, along with the endless arguments over which monuments belong to which categories, offering the terms raised stone or propped stone as alternatives. Vicky Cummings and Colin Richards, in their recently published re-examination of megalithic architecture in Northern Europe, are asking us to recognise that some dolmens were never encased within mounds or cairns at all. Rather, their purpose was first and foremost to create a display. The authors describe dolmens in terms of wonder, enchantment, power and dramatic effect. They are spectacular, amazing in the true sense of causing astonishment, and more than a little bit magical. All terms that we are familiar with in the work of people interested in mysticism and the occult, but not often used by archaeologists. Nevertheless, the authors present a well-argued case that we are doing the builders of these extraordinary monuments a disservice 
in not recognising dolmens as astonishing works of architecture that still have the power to make us stand in wonder some 6,000 years after they were first conceived and built. With approval, they quote Andrew Fleming, who wrote as long ago as 1973 in Tombs for the Living in the journal Man, that it seems quite clear that these tombs, far from being merely containers for the dead, were quite deliberately designed to rivet the attention of living individuals. Before heading inland of the Penkaya Peninsula, we have some mermaid folklore from Clanunda. There are several versions of the story, but they all agree that a mermaid was captured by a group of brothers below the cliffs of Clanunda. They carried her home and kept her locked away for some time. She begged to be returned to the Brineland and said that in return she would give them three important pieces of advice. They eventually gave in and carried her back to the sea, and she told them these three things. Skim the surface of the pottage before adding sweet milk to it. It will be whiter and sweeter and less of it will do. Take your coins and turn them every time there is a full moon, preferably in the light of the moon. Save your cider to pour on the apple tree soon after Han Galan. Apparently, the family still follows these rules to this day. In J. Howard Hughes' version of the tale, published in 1966, it is said that the mermaid was carried from Abba Bach to Tresillicht Farm. Carried from the sea, she warned the locals that if they did not return her to the waves, some awful event would smite the area. She was quickly returned, and some speak of the mermaid leaving a curse which led to no children being born in Tresillicht for decades. After a long day bothering unfamiliar stones, we thought we'd end the tour with a visit to Fist Sampson. It's quite a quirky little cromlech, its capstone perched upon just two uprights. Very jaunty, and a lovely little place to relax. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, join in, subscribe, and help us keep making these videos. Diochen Vaur.